Okay, everybody, we're going to get started again. So I'm uh, very much looking forward to this session, second session at the uh, Institute program, which is a consumers and family members discussion. Um, so, and we're honored to have consumers Tristan Scremen of Painted Brain, ben, Brenda Ibanez of Reaching Future Opportunities, Anna Swartz doing graduate studies at Michigan Tech, and Harold Turner, a family member of a daughter with mental illness, and a director of programs, NAMI Urban Los Angeles, that has worked with upward of 400 families. Clearly, the people most affected by civil commitment are patients themselves, and to some extent, their families. How do patients experience involuntary care? Are they grateful for it after the fact? Do they agree with the substantive standard? If not, what would their standard for civil commitment look like? And how do family members think about these issues, as well as how best to work together with other families to get, advocate for change or give support? So um, questions for consumers first. Um, you know, tell me a little bit about your history, what, what, your, what your mental illness looked like, and what, were your, what was your experience with voluntary and involuntary, involuntary hospitals, inpatient hospitalization? Um, so what did you look like? What was the experience? Um, what rubric were you committed under, danger or gravely disabled, and do you think you actually met those criteria? Anna? All right, I'll start. Um, my name is Anna Swartz. Um, I was uh, diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, bipolar type, about three years ago. It was my first year of graduate school. And um, I was actually diagnosed after being arrested um, for sending threatening email messages to various people, including myself. Um, I uh, spent about two months in the uh, county jail while waiting um, to be sent to the state hospital for a competency hearing. At the time, um, I was, I would say, for lack of a better term, completely out of my mind. Um, I was definitely, in terms of how I physically looked, I can't remember other than people telling me I was disheveled, um, just completely just out of it. Um, at, while in the jail, I was actually unmedicated until I went to the state hospital. Um, so that was a court-ordered and voluntary um, commitment. I've also had voluntary commitments. And I guess just the one thing I can note as a patient in the state hospital, um, and this was a state hospital that didn't have a ton of resources either, or possibly the best resources, but just how rarely in my life have I ever felt such a radical and visceral imbalance of power um, being in that situation. I also felt as though I was just being medicated without being talked to at all. Um, there was definitely a lack of communication between people, um, between people and me about my treatment. It felt like I was just being medicated in order to be restored um, so I could be fit for court. Um, yeah, so it was definitely, it was a traumatic experience all around. Okay, where are others? Tristan? Yeah, I, I had a very traumatic experience too and I, I got treated really badly by a lot of people. Um, I also, you know, I'm, I'm a person who became violent. And, um, you know, I became violent against my dad. It was a family member. It was a horrible thing. It was very shocking to me. I'm not a violent person, but I had a lot of um, paranoia about my dad. And I thought he was going to do terrible things to me, so I assaulted him. It was a very serious assault. It was a felony assault. I was sent to L.A. County Jail. Before that, I was hospitalized two times before that. Once was voluntary at uh, UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute, um, and one was involuntary at Cedars, which I think is closed now. But so I, I've both been I, I, had ten, I had a 5150. I had a voluntary stay, and I was um, I had a 1026. I was sent to Patton State Hospital, where I, where I was institutionalized for four years. Wow. wow. Yeah. Looking back, are you? You How know, do you think about it? It, w it was beneficial for me. Um, you know, I, I think had it not been for the violence, I think I may have spent years and years just uh, 
deteriorating in the community. I don't know if that would have been better or worse. I have no idea. Um, I, maybe I would have eventually accepted it. Um, I did have a lot of people in my life, including my family and friends, telling me, Tristan, you know, you're really not doing well. This is not working out for you. And uh, I, I really resisted that. I, I, I cheeked my medicine. I spit it out. I did all, all that kind of stuff. Um, and to be honest, I mean, the medication makes you feel horrible. And who wants to admit like that you have a mental illness? You know, it's a really hard thing to to admit to. And there's still a ton of stigma out there, and a lot of people don't want to be part of this group. And I really think that a community-based system, although I went through the criminal system, I don't wish that for anyone. You know, I think we need a community-based system that is strong enough, healthy enough, and interesting enough that people will actually want to join it. So mm -hmm. that's, that's where I think the real core is. But me personally, from my personal life, I think I benefited greatly from going to a state hospital. Interesting. Brenda? Thank you, Ellen. Is this on? Hi. I'm sorry, guys. I, I'm kind of feeling sick, but I'm here, and I want to thank you, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I guess our stories are all pretty much similar. Um, I came from a background of self-medication, uh, medicating myself uh, with alcohol, and a lot of the uh, symptoms that I was having um, when I would get arrested for assault, per se, it was um, people thought that I was under the influence of drugs as well. Um, I went through a whole cycle of diagnoses through the DMS, um, DM5. They first thought I was bipolar, and then they thought I was um, manic depressive. Then they finally um, titled me as paranoid schizophrenic, which I heard now ha that has changed as well. Um, I went through a process of institutionalizing myself the system institutionalized me as well. And because they couldn't pinpoint what was wrong with me, I went through a series of medications that, um, as Tristan and I were speaking earlier, were pretty much a trial and error and see which one would work. Um, unfortunately, many of the medications for um, psychosis, they have severe side effects. and. Um, for the, the paranoid schizophrenic that I am, um, some of that medication made me become really irrational and, and, and wanting to harm myself. So I was institutionalized at um, Hospital 5150, and then I was arrested and was sent to a um, D.D. Hirsch Alcohol Mental Health Treatment Center this was back in the early 2000s, where I still didn't know exactly what was wrong with me. All I knew is that drinking made me happy and made me be able to be around people. Um, and of course, they couldn't tell because they were drunk themselves, so they didn't know what was wrong with me either. Uh, <laughs> and I fit in perfectly well. Um, unfortunately, with mixing medication and alcohol, there are actually um, bad things that come with that. And that being said, I did end up getting arrested for forgery. I was trying to hide from the government, and I had a fake driver's license. And it was, this was right after the Patriot, Patriot Bill, Patriot Act, and they thought I was a terrorist. And it's so funny because my, my first therapist that helped me get where I'm at today is actually here today. Thank you very much for being part of my life. Um, so I can't lie up here, right? She knows my whole story. <laughs> but when I came to her and I told her why it was that I got arrested and what I had done, she was baffled. She said, wait a minute, a fake driver's license? And what had happened was it wasn't just the fake driver's license. Of course, I had gotten a DUI and I had gotten assault because I was drinking and acting, you know, foolish in the street. Um, but it did end up giving me a, a five-year sentence at a state prison up in Chowchilla. Um, now, mind you, before, before going into that institution, I was, I was being tossed between bipolar and manic and schizo, and nobody really knew what was wrong with me. But one of the things about being in an institution is, at that institution, is that I had all the time in the world to visit my doctors and my psychologists, right? 
It was, there was no social life at all. There was no interruptions, no telephone calls, no family, no, no nothing to get in the way of really finding out what was wrong with me. And also what medication worked and what medication didn't work. Um, that being said, I too, like Tristan, believe that even though it was a horrible experience, it took me away from my family and friends and society as a whole, it, it, it did give me the time to um, deal with my mental health issues and for the doctors and therapists there to really pinpoint what it was that was wrong with me and get me on the proper medication that today, to this day, I'm still on and have been very successful with it. Great, thank you so thank you. much. Um, yeah. Um, so, for the consumers, and we'll we'll talk to you, Harold, soon. What do you think the most appropriate standard for civil commitment is? Should it be mentally ill and dangerous to self or others? Should you have the root of seriously mentally ill and in need of treatment? maybe adding on and unable to appreciate the need for treatment. How do you, what, what do you think the best system would be in terms of, go ahead. I think that, um, I mean, the legal issue is really important, but we already have a lot of laws. I mean, in terms of like, we have gravely disabled and we have dangerous to self and others. And I think that's enough because a lot of people, I mean, we were talking, the panel before this one talked a little bit about how there are people who probably fit this standard of gravely, I mean, homeless, shoot, wearing no shoes, you know, urinating on yourself, but you're digging through the trash, so you're, you're feeding yourself, that's, you're not gravely disabled. I mean, there's a lot of people in LA County who could potentially be gravely disabled if the court found that. But as a policy issue, I think, We've closed the hospital system, and we've and rather than deinstitutionalize people, we've transinstitutionalized them to homelessness in prison. And that's, I, I actually think we need state hospitals. And you know, I, I think that, um, you know, if 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 it's it's really a policy question, are we going to invest in institutions and in and, and in the community system too? Absolutely. I mean, I think the community system is the where we should be spending the most money. So uh, I think that gravely disabled and dangerous to self and others, I don't think we need that many more laws if, if we really do, um, as a public policy question, you know, fund state hospitals and fund community. Uh, I, I, uh, I really have a terrible memory. Did I tell people how, why I was committed? So I was committed, this is a long time ago, as dangerous to self and others and gravely disabled. Uh, the reason they gave that I was gravely disabled was that I couldn't do my Yale Law School homework, <laughs> which made me wonder about much of the rest of New Haven. <laughs> <laughs> uh. On Tristan's point, I, I'd like to see, um, in terms of community care, I'd like to see more person-centered or patient-centered yeah. care, yeah. Uh, more collaborative decision-making. I feel like the power dynamics um, and the way we treat mental illness, even within the best hospitals, it seems to be a medication first. And I'm not denying that this is not a medication issue. Um, medication has saved my life. But I feel like there is additional component like psychotherapy and talk therapy and just having a supportive social environment. I know that my experience of mental illness has come with a fundamental loss of like who I am, a loss of self, a loss of self-esteem. And I feel like having some sort of collaborative, um, you know, breaking down the power dynamics in that sort of treatment um, environment would go a long way to, you know, self-empowering patients. Interesting. Yeah. Harold, what, what, how, what rubric was your own daughter uh, hospitalized under and how did, how did that affect you? Yeah, well, my daughter's story is... Yeah. My daughter's story is very similar to Tristan's, actually. Okay. Uh, we've talked about that a couple of times. Okay. Um, you know, she was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia in her junior year in college. And um, that started us down the road with dealing with mental health issues. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, we had difficulty getting her connected with services initially. 
there were a lot of things that probably could have uh, gotten her help, but we just simply didn't know it at that time. Um, but finally, after about four years of dealing with her mental health issues, um, I came to a decision that if she was going to remain in the home, she had to be connected with treatment. Otherwise, I was ready to go because it was, uh, it was dangerous, you know, and, um, you know, she had, uh, had set the house on fire, things oh, like that. God. I wasn't really willing to risk the rest of the family anymore. And um, it took, you know, some conversation between us and then the ultimatum, and she agreed to get treatment. And she really did um, uh, comply with it, and uh, she started to get better, and she started to manage her own medications. We had rules around that, and, and she was compliant with that um, for five years, you know. She was managing her own meds and thought things were going well. Um, and then she decided to stop taking the medications because she attributed the side effects of the medication to her inability uh, to get employment. And uh, we were actually on vacation and um, she had a severe uh, attack of psychosis, attacked a family member, her younger sister, you know, and um, it was a horrendous attack. She was very lucky to survive. And then she tried to, uh, tried to commit suicide, failed in that, and turned herself in uh, to the police department. And, um, and one thing on, I wanted to say on that, though, it, it really taught me the difference between being asymptomatic and being well, that those are very different things, you know, and I didn't know anything at the time except, you know, she wasn't displaying symptoms, no talking to herself, no doing all of those things that were associated with the illness. So we were satisfied, you know. When she was arrested, she was charged with premeditated attempted murder in the system. Um, you know, we didn't want to go through a jury trial because we felt like, uh, you know, th what's the point in that? We would, it's the legal term, stipulate to that. <laughs> you know, there were only two people home. Of course she did it. You know, but um, um, they insisted on having a trial. Hmm. You know, all the delays that went along with that. And um, it took a jury, uh, this was year and a half later by the time we got to this point, took a jury, you know, just over an hour, probably including lunch, to find her guilty of the lesser charge they could, which was assault with a deadly weapon. You know, and then in the sanity phase of the trial, she was found not guilty by reason of insanity and remanded to the state hospital. And then you just go to the next level of fighting. <laughs> you know, is that how do you actually get in the hospital? Right. You know, there's no beds, there's right. all of this going on. So that was another fight. You know, you ended up as a family member. Um, you know, I didn't end up getting any action on that till I ran into a judge at a play, actually, and accosted him <laughs> and his wife. And, you know, Say, so, hey, I'm not getting any action here. I was just telling her about that. He goes, well, all I can do is write the order. I said, exactly. You know, it's, it's an order, you know, not a suggestion. You know, how do you, you, know, how do you get from here to there? You know, and uh, he understood and brought me back to court, and we worked our way through that, and, you know, she finally got to the hospital. Ironically, jail was the first place they got her medications correct. So by the time she got to the hospital, um, she was accepting of her illness. Uh, I tried to look for the bright side on what happened with this whole unnecessary trial thing, but I think um, hearing the testimony of what had happened um, kind of convinced her uh, that she needed help and what could happen if she did not manage the illness. Right. 
Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, can the panelists think of ways that we could kind of design the system to make civil commitment and voluntary care less traumatic and less toxic? What could we do? I mean, could we have a peer with the doctor who says, we're gonna put you in the hospital? What, what, can you think of things that we could do? Yeah. Hi. Um, so um, through the past seven years, I've been, I've been uh, getting an education in political science and public policy. And I got into public policy specifically to try to find a way of helping um, guide the mental health issue and decriminalization factor. Um, because it, it's so, you know, it happened to me and it happens to so many people that I know that I, I've been trying to put together some type of policy change for um, the convictions that occur in, in, in jails and uh, in, uh, courtrooms. Um, but one of the things that I, I know have, um, I've seen happen with RFO, uh, which is Reaching Future Opportunities, a nonprofit that we started together at my, with my peers, is that if we get families involved in, in the process of getting to know why a child or a young adult is behaving in a certain way, not only um, finding out why they're acting this way, but actually getting informed and getting the proper training as to how to deal with someone that has um, bipolar disorder, the symptoms, the effects, the medication, um, getting a full awareness of what's happening along with the medical care that they have with their psychologists and psychiatrists. But I really believe that there needs to be a connection because I think, I'm sure everyone here right now is saying that they finally figured out what medication worked for us once we were in an institution of jail or prison or, or patent hospital. That shouldn't be happening to us. You know, I, I, I look back and I think, I, I was a very in, uh, intelligent, you know, hardworking, steadfast, and um, wanted to succeed in the world, but I couldn't because of all of the things that were happening in my life due to the many medications that I was put on incorrectly and was diagnosed incorrectly. And why is it that until I went to uh, the Central Women's Facility in Chowchilla, is it that they finally figured out what was wrong with me? I spent four years, eight months there, away from my family. I wasn't a criminal. You know, I had mental health issues. So the, what I believe should happen is that the therapist that finally was able to help me, she's here today, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, she showed me a world where my illness didn't have to debilitate nor have to dictate the rest of my life as someone who had to bounce from treatment to treatment and never do anything with my life. She introduced me to Ellen's book and the rest is, is history, I'm here. And Ellen and I, <laughs> we're, we're really good friends. Thank you. Um, but that being said, you know, I think if there's a collaborative move between family members, the actual therapists that are working with you at the time, and when you get arrested or you're already in that situation, call out to the family, call out to the therapists that have been seeing you so that they get an in-depth information as to where you've been and what happened. Something happened for you to be in this situation. And if the family member doesn't know that your therapist is going to know and be able to create some type of programming for you, instead of going to jail, maybe constant therapy, maybe therapy twice or three times a week instead of being institutionalized. But also, if it's going to be an involuntary commitment situation, have the person that is closest to you, that is well-trained, that is well-informed with your diagnosis to be present, and I'm gonna share this with you. In 2012, I was already a college student at Pasadena City College, and I went through a psychotic break. When I ended up in Huntington Medical, the people, they took me in, they said that they were going to 5150 me, and that um, that was it. I had caused a lot of damage on the campus, and that no one was going to help me. Well, with that being said, I, I kept telling them that I was being bewitched, that I was being bewitched. 
the staff there at that hospital started making jokes and making fun of me, telling me that I was talking about the television show Bewitched. I wasn't talking about that. And they were making fun of me, and they kept telling me, wiggle your nose, wiggle your nose. And so what I propose is that maybe when this situation occurs, that advocate that's either your family member or your therapist should be there from day one and not leave your side. Because I was, I was actually on four points that time. They, they four pointed me. But what I'm saying is if there's someone there, someone who can advocate for you, no one can make fun of you outside of what's already happening in your own head. It was a very humiliating experience. And if I told anybody, hey, this is the way they treated me, do you really think they'd believe me? I'm the one that was going through the psychotic break. <laughs> These were professionals. And I think there has to be a third person with you there, somebody to advocate for you that knows what you've been through, that knows what you're going through, that knows your behaviors, that is able to bring out a sheet and say, look, this is what's happening with her right now, and this is what she needs. So, so one last thank you. One last question before we open it to the audience. And I'm sort of interested um, in the idea of advanced directives where people, when they're in a healthy state of mind, say, in the future, if this happens, you know, if I become ill, this is what I want to be done. Um, I think you can't say, I don't want to be committed if I meet the commitment standards, but you could say, I would like to be hospitalized before I became dangerous to self or others or gravely disabled, and here are the behaviors I would want to evidence and the symptoms I want, would want to address. I mean, I'm just wondering what you all think about that as an idea sort of going forward to sort of empower consumers to have sort of more of a say in their treatment. Yeah. Um, I think advanced, I think that's a great idea in terms of, um, you know, empowering and um, respecting the autonomy of patients. And I also think it's great because it facilitates a conversation up front with your healthcare provider that, you know, this is what I'd like to happen in, you know, in such and such event. Um, one thing I'm concerned about, I, and I, I come from a, um, rural Michigan where there's a lack of services and I wonder how easy could that be implemented um, in an area or how does that transfer between healthcare providers um, yeah. so I guess those are my concerns I feel like it's a, it sounds like a great idea but I feel like there needs to be more systemic um, improvements to mental health I actually in a different context was being about you know doing an intake to go get physical health treatment, and the woman asked, do you have an advanced directive, an advanced health directive? And I said, yes. And that's the end of the conversation, not what it said, where we find it. It just, yeah. Anyway, Harold? Yeah. I would, is this working? Yeah, yeah. okay. You know, um, my daughter in, ended up, in, like I said, in the state hospital system. Uh, and it came just about the time the... Um, the state hospital system was operating under a consent decree with the Department of Justice. It was about to take it over. It was so horrible. And they had installed a court monitor to kind of oversee that transition to a more patient-centered model. And, um, and for me, my daughter ended up with a, having a six-person care team around the clock. Wow. And so, you know, the hospital did a great job with the meager resources they had and we had a NAMI group out of there who advocated for more resources for them to do it and uh, my daughter agreed so I received all the reports you know that went to the court by, about how she, well she was doing and all of that and then I met quarterly with her care team and more frequently if I needed to working with my social worker to talk to individual members of the team so I was really pleased with that because it gave me uh, a basis for engaging my daughter in conversation based on what the, you know, her care team was saying. So I, I thought that was tremendous, you know, but um, unfortunately it sort of stopped at the hospital door. There are multiple uh, parts to the system. Once you end up in the, in the system as a, uh, an NGI or 1026 or not guilty by reason of insanity, 
there's only one way out through this program called the Conditional Release Program. And uh, that program was not part of the original review by the Justice Department. So they operated in, uh, in ways uh, that were inconsistent with the way things were operating in the hospital. And that proved to be, and actually I'm, I'll defer to Tristan on that one a lot, but it, you know, that was a tremendous problem we had. I, I agree, that is, that is something we have to look at eventually. Um, in terms of advanced directives, I think they're great. It's a wonderful tool. I have an advanced directive. I wrote it in my own handwriting. You know, I got some tips from Mental Health Advocacy Services. I know they're here. And, uh, you know, I got a, it. It comes in a form. You know, it's, it's a form you have to fill out. And I put it in my own handwriting just so that there's no question this is what Tristan wanted. You know, it's clearly in his own handwriting. I explained as much as I could. I talked about my past. I talked about how I want to be treated. I talked about some medications that I didn't want to be on unless I had to be on them. And, um, you know, I was on the earlier antipsychotics, Haldol and Navain, and those were very hard on me. And I specifically spelled all that stuff out. So I think that as much agency as we can give to the person experiencing the uh, madness, uh, that's really where it's at. I mean, if we're going to engage with people, we have to give them agency. And, and advanced directive, I think, is one, one space that we still have a little bit of wiggle room. Great, great point. Why don't we open it up for questions? The mic is over there. Hi, my name is Rudy Caceres, um, and I'm a victim of forced hospitalization, and I'm speaking for myself, but also for everyone who can't be here and who is actually forcibly hospitalized right as we speak. Um, and I'm just a little troubled by the fact that I haven't seen anyone on this panel who is completely anti-forced treatment, despite that being the theme. It doesn't seem fair and balanced. Um, Anna came close, and I thank you for speaking out, but it's... I mean, people who are out there, people who are out there, like myself, who can say without a shadow of a doubt, I was forcibly hospitalized multiple times, I was put in restraints multiple times, forcibly catheterized, and I came out, um, I'm a successful person, I'm independent living, and I can honestly say it is not as a result of me being forcibly hospitalized, I think that was BS, it is a result despite of it. Like, I like to compare um, that you wouldn't tell someone who was a victim of domestic abuse, like, oh, it's great that you had that happen to you because now you get to be this great advocate. And I just feel like there's not enough representation of us on these panels. Um, I'm troubled that we have to be combined with the families despite their best intentions. There's all the panels that I've been here, I don't think I've ever seen a person who is trans, let alone someone who is trans and a person of color, despite them being significantly more likely to be forcibly hospitalized and even be subject to violence by the police and the mental health care system. And But I keep coming to these things because I want to work with you, all of you, and not against you. I have to deal with the snickers and the groans from the audience. but. That's okay, because I want to keep being a voice against forced treatment. Thank you. Hi. My name is Tracy Kaplan, and I come from, um, I'm a social worker at an acute care hospital. Um, I'm not saying the name of it for a reason. We have, we're a very good hospital, but we're not LPS designated. We don't have a psychiatric unit. And something that you all have told us is you really didn't get help until you got institutionalized in one way or another. Um, it became very extreme. Um, the reason I'm not saying my hospital is we do have psychiatrists on consultation. And I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't send my dog to one of these psychiatrists. Oh God. And my question is, how does one, what is your suggestion to finding a good provider, a good caregiver, long before you get to the point of having to be severely institutionalized? Um, I talked about going to NAMI, the 12-week education course we had, and it's just this Saturday, as a matter of fact, we were going over crisis files with families and talking about uh, uh, various aspects of preparing for crisis, you know, when they happen. And one of that was a list about, uh, this is a good psychiatrist. 
And I said, well, I, you know, I can leave you to read that on your own. If you find him, he's probably sitting firmly astride a unicorn. Yeah. I never seen this guy. You know? I never talked to any families who've seen this guy. But this is what they say he looks like. You know, if you were to find him, so we can go on to more substantive things. And, um, you know, and it's just, it's just no way. You know, we get a lot of times, who would you recommend? I don't know anybody that, you know, that I would recommend or whose outcome I would be confident, you know, would work for you. So um, that's a broad question and in, in it's... And, and the one group in our area that I hear that comes highly recommended doesn't take insurance. Their cash pay for a lot of money. So they're not useful to most of the people in the community. That's a huge issue. Yeah. I actually have a very good friend who's a psychiatrist at the Edelman Center for Mental Health Law in Los, Los Angeles. She has 350 patients. How on earth do you do that? You know, I just, you know. And actually, my psychiatrist that I see, um, and it took me about six months to get in, but she uh, is four hours away in a different state. So I have to travel that far. Um, in my area, which is a university town, there is not one single psychiatrist. Actually, I think there is now. They may have, have one at the hospital now, but for the longest time, there wasn't one psychiatrist serving four counties. And the closest was in a, a larger town about two hours away. Um, but still, once that once you get an appointment there, or if you do get an appointment, it's about a, you know six months to a year or longer waiting list to get in, and you're not you know that doesn't guarantee you're going to jive with that person either. So, um, so I'm about to be 48 years old, and I started seeing someone for my mental health issues when I was 19 years old, and. It's sad to say that the only psychiatrist I can truly remember made an impression and change in my life was one um, psychiatrist. A psychologist, I've had a few, but with psychiatry, I believe that you know it's so easy to just dispense medication and not really get into what's happening in the brain of this individual, which is what has occurred, you know, with me. But this doctor, and I'll mention him. Maybe he's here, Dr. Ganji. Dr. Ganji, you know, he didn't just hear my problems or look at the labs. He had me actually do work, you know, notebook work and timelines and be able to pinpoint where exactly my psychosis, I, you know, the break was. And that, when I saw him doing that, I, you know, I was besides myself. And it was really unfortunate that I couldn't see him anymore. And it's because I was forcefully, you know, hospitalized. I went to Dee Dee Hirsch Hospital. Um, and I couldn't see him anymore when I came back because I had lost my insurance. So, I mean, this is just a vicious cycle, and I, 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 I hope that we can resolve something through uh, the Sex Institute and all these conversations that we have, hopefully. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joy. Um, I'm a volunteer for um, NAMI and uh, Mental Health Department, LA County. Um, uh, I really appreciate my therapist gave me the information. I mean, I can be, uh, I can uh, join this meeting and uh, uh, also uh, feel excited. I can hear the uh, story of Anna, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, if uh, I have to label myself with my neighbor, uh, the only one uh, I would like to put on myself is a mental health advocate or mental health consumer. And uh, maybe most of you, I uh, couldn't imagine what a tough process I went through myself and my family um, can accept the concept of consumer, mental health consumer. Because um, even um, as a new immigrant here, um, um, uh, the first time I can remember I, my, my, my father uh, visiting me and uh, uh, he came to uh, he accompanied me to my therapist's office, and uh, only one time, only once, and uh, he couldn't, you know, she, he, he just said, oh, my daughter is so brilliant lawyer, and uh, she's so successful here, and how could he, how could she see a therapist and the psychosis? And uh, so, I mean, um, not only my family, I'm myself, and uh, I'm speaking here not only for myself, 
also for my community, because for myself, I really uh, appreciate that I could uh, have the access to mental health um, resources. Like, um, yeah, I also met my first teacher here uh, in mental health um, uh, field and uh, Libby, and I really appreciate everyone who, yeah, been part of my recovery and uh, also my future, maybe my future career, and. Um, uh, my question, yeah, I do have a lot of question for for you know mental health resources we can reach out for, especially uh, in our Asian community, even here, and um, um, yeah, I'm also a, 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 a applicant for uh, law, <coughs> law uh, LLM program of USC, and maybe I'm gonna um, start my. Uh, um, um, study here this first semester, but my target or my um, uh, focus is really in mental health field. I really would like to combine mental health advocacy with law because uh, I, uh, according to my own experience um, in this field, and also I went back to China last month and for three weeks, and uh, I do feel in China and uh, even Asian community here, even my church community here, um, there's really very, very heavy discrimination stigma towards mental health, mental illness. And um, um, one thing I would like to share is in my, uh, in my first training in, um, uh, from at Shell and my teacher here, and uh, I'm required to uh, do a referral to uh, do a referral of a self-help support group to my community. I mean, uh, this is very, you know, is a like kind of common sense for people here. Any kinds of, uh, you know, mental illness or mental, you know, not only mental. We can, yeah, we can, we can reach out for self-help support group. But, uh, but this is the first time, you know, many, you know, most of my uh, church com church members they they never heard this this concept. So, um, yeah, I know time is limited, and uh, I do have a lot of questions for my um, for my community Asian group uh, um, when they have uh, they have this kind of uh, um, needs. How how could they so, reach so out? So not not yeah. to interrupt. But this would be something I think it would be interesting to talk to people about. As we Men wrap up, but we we have some more questions. So oh, that sorry. Okay. Yeah, maybe I, I would yeah start my study here, and uh, I can right. figure out these questions. Yeah. Thank okay. you so much. Sure. Thank Thanks. You. Sorry. I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge all of you. To acknowledge what? All of you on the panel. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we all know that changing culture is key and very challenging. And you are all such role models and examples of being heroic. Okay. And I just didn't want this moment of the way that you're revolutionizing advocacy and sharing your stories. I didn't want to let it pass. So thank you. Thank you. I feel bad because she said something really nice and I'm going to say something <laughs> that's maybe not so nice. Um, my name is Roberta and uh, our son is almost 50 and he has serious mental illness with bipolar and schizo and that kind of stuff. But it doesn't show. He really doesn't. He plays piano at elder care places. They love him. He loves them. But he doesn't take his medicine. So every so often he has a break to end all breaks. And recently he had such a break. And <clears throat> took him to, oh, first I'd like to just say something to the sheriffs. The sheriffs are the kindest people when you call them and they come to help you at your home. Thank you so much. Okay, this letter went to Exodus. It went to LAC USC. It went to Huntington Hospital. It went to USC Keck Hospital. It went to Catherine Barger, who's a LA supervisor. It went to HIPAA, and it went to Congressman Schiff. And of that, 
list, the only person who answered was the superintendent, Catherine Barger, and I'm pretty sure she wanted my vote. So um, the thing is, is that our son was rejected by all of those hospitals, that he was not 5150. Um, I'm not going to read you this, but HIPAA is one thing that I think might possibly be responsible for so much of the homelessness. Anyway, he did not, he was not taken in, he came home, I walked into his room, and he was cutting his wrist with a butcher knife. If that's not 5150, I don't know what is. And if these hospitals can't even answer a letter, it's, what do they even care about? You know? So that's what I want you to know. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Dave Meyer. Uh, this, this morning during this panel, I was surprised to the level of being stunned of hearing so many positive stories about institutional care, especially through the criminal justice system. This is an area in which I've worked. I'm a lawyer. It's an area in which I've worked for going on 45 years now, and I probably heard the second, third, fourth, and fifth positive stories about that level of institutional care just this morning. So it's gratifying. Uh, and it's very unusual. So following that up, I have two questions. First, what was you, you, you've all achieved remarkable goals. Uh, I congratulate you and admire you and uh, uh, hope I see you again and hear more about it. Uh, what was it that your lawyer did? Several of you were involved in criminal cases. What was it that the lawyer for you did to help you and support you in achieving the goals that you've achieved? What was your lawyer's role? What did you think about it? Uh, how good, good uh, were they in achieving that, or were they good at all? Second question for Tristan. Uh, you were involved, necessarily involved in the conditional release program, I assume here in Los Angeles. Uh, that program is unconnected to either the state hospital uh, or to the community mental health system. And I wondered what your experience was uh, with conditional release uh, and whether or not they were helpful in supporting uh, you in achieving your personal goals uh, and achieving independence. Thank you. That's a great question. I, I will say I had a lot of trauma in institutions. It's not like it was a, a beautiful, excellent experience the whole time. You know, I was beaten up by the police several times when I was in custody. Uh, you know, I was beaten up by other inmates. It's a violent, terrible place. LA County Jail is a horrible place to be. I was also in Patton State Hospital for four years. Actually, the lawyer who helped me through navigate this process is here, Ellie. She's a public defender. She's incredible. Probably the most talented mental health lawyer I have ever met, personally. You know, just incredible. I think that the role of the lawyer is very important. I mean, unfortunately, so many of us have interaction with the criminal justice system, sometimes because of violence and sometimes having nothing to do with violence. Maybe it's just sleeping in someone's car or stealing food or, you know, so many things, uh, sleeping in public. A gentleman talked about someone breaking into someone's house and falling asleep. I mean, there are a lot of sort of loony things that can happen when you're not, you know, when you're experiencing madness that can interact with the crim criminal system. Um, I, I think that... Um, you know, I, I also was part of CONRAP. I was part of LA CONRAP, and then I was part of San Bernardino CONRAP. And you, I, 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 Harold mentioned this too. I think there's no oversight for the CONRAP system. I, I think they're they're sort of uh, they 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 sort of uh, supervise themselves. You know, which is a weird thing. Uh, I think there's a lot of problems with that. As Harold was talking about, I think it's very easy to get into the criminal system, and it's very difficult to get out. I did have to file for a petition of sanity, I think it's called. And, uh, yeah. 
So I, I did have to fight that, and Ellie helped me a great deal. Um, it's a difficult, difficult process to get out of the system. And uh, I, I, I think a lot of people also get stagnated. You know, they, people end up in state hospital. I have friends that are there for 20 years for things that are not very serious. Um, and I, I think that a lot of people get stuck in the system. Uh, and not that many people move all the way through like I did. I had a lot of uh, people advocating for me, and uh, I had an incredible support system. But I'm not, I'm not a typical case. That's why I felt kind of weird being on this panel. And this was talked about earlier, too, like forced care. You know, for me, forced care was not a question. I became violent. It, was, it wasn't like I was being forced treatment because, you know, I was having weird thoughts or something. No, I, I was a, I be, you know, I perpetrated violence. I think I, I needed to be, you know, hospitalized to, for me to come to terms with that violence. Uh, other people, I, I, that's why, I mean, I, I think I'm a, a very kind of atypical case. So I, I, I worry about extrapolating all these, you know, things out of Tristan's case because it's not, it's not that typical. I also want to reiterate, too, that my experience was very traumatic being institutionalized. Um, and it's a limited panel. We only have a, cer a certain amount of time. But it was not at all um, a positive experience for me. I can't think of any positive part of it. Um, and I'm happy are, to talk more too. about that. Me too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Um, OK, you talk about advocacy. And usually, the best advocates are the parents. My, by the way, my name is Diana Guth, and I'm up here as a as a parent. And the, usually, the best advocates and the the people that know the the consumers best are the are the parents. Mm -hmm. And uh, but the uh, the the consumers have the right to say they are not allowed to speak to their doctors, their psychiatrists, all the people involved. And um, I find this to be highly problematic. Do you have any anything to say about that? Well, I really like the model we talked about, the, pr the previous panel talked about collaborative decision making. Mm -hmm. You know, that, I think that's the way to go. You know, and to me, you know, what people need is some control at that point. You know, when you being held against your will and you're not control of anything. You know, they want to be included in on the decision-making piece. So I think it's very important uh, for us as family members to be aware of that. You know, and in the, in the system doesn't, my fights are always the other way. You know, the question should always be, what does this particular person need to do better and function better? You know, not categorizing people by diagnosis and going from them. What does this individual standing in front of me need to be better and to realize their goals in life? And how can I help them get those resources? And I know that's difficult and it's expensive, but it's much more expensive not to do. And I think there's much more needs to go into that piece of realizing Finding out what resources does this particular person need in order to realize their goals and help them attain that. And that requires a lot of collaboration with your loved one. A lot of family members, you know, want to get back on the track or do what they were doing before. That may not be what they want, you know. So it needs to be inclusive. It needs to be collaborative to work. Okay, we're going to have to end this, this session. Thank you to the panelists. So we're going to have about a 10-minute break um, and uh, come back for the third panel.